Scott Mast and Chris Vogel join me this week to discuss new hop varieties being grown in the Great Lakes region. This is Beersmith Podcast number 238. This is Beersmith Podcast number 238, and it's late June 2021. Scott Mast and Chris Vogel join me this week to discuss new hop varieties being grown in the Great Lakes region. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Finally, I'm happy to say that the new web based version of Beersmith is available now at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the Web lets you build, edit, and brew recipes from any browser, including your desktop, tablet, or mobile device. The new web-based version gives you access to tens of thousands of recipes, online recipe editing, advanced water tools, and more from any device. You can try Beersmith Web for free for 30 days by setting up an account at BeersmithRecipes.com. Or if you purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, you get both Beersmith Web and the desktop version for one low price. Check out BeersmithRecipes.com now to give Beersmith Web a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Scott Mast and Chris Vogel. Scott is a Michigan-based hop farmer with years in the business and an owner of Hang'em High Hops, the largest producer of Michigan proprietary hops. Uh, Chris is a Great Lakes hops employee focused on everything from uh, propagation to commercial sales, and he also works to bring new hops to the market. It's great to have you guys on the show. How are you doing, Chris? Doing well, thank you. And Scott, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Brad. Thank you for having us on the show. My pleasure. Um, well, Scott, it's great to have you on the show. Why don't we start with a general uh, resurgence of hop growing in the Great Lakes region? What's going on up there? So uh, the general resurgence kind of started back in 2018, or 2008, I'm sorry and uh, has been kind of working its way up to around 800 plus acres in 2018 with a little bit of a sharp drop off uh, of around 250 to 300 acres over the last three years, Hmm. both due to the uh, market and the environment for retail and resale of hops. Um, The resurgence really came to us um, during that time where we were trying to get some new products into our fields And for some reason, I explain hop growing a lot like looking for gold. Once you get the bug, you can't stop it. You're uh, you're so interested in the process of growing these um, very strange plants that you uh, you don't listen to reason. And uh, um, everyone that's in the business now has really filtered themselves through uh, to get to the point where they're growing a product that's both capable for the market and qualified for the market. But uh, the resurgence hit across all of Michigan with over 300 small farms and is now really based off from probably 50 um, larger farms uh, with only about five or six that are kind of the leading edge of 500 plus acres uh, across Michigan. Are there, are there um, unique aspects of the area that make uh, you know growing hops suitable? Because I know they can only be grown in certain areas. Absolutely. Um, the biggest thing that we have here that's uh, uh, kind of challenged the out west uh, review of how to grow hops and when to grow hops and, and what works for us is we have water and an abundance of it. Um, that allows us to uh, deal with certain areas of growing that uh, they might not have capabilities of. Uh, we can punch a well in, you know, 100 to 180 feet and we got 200 to 400 gallons a minute uh, available. Um, along with that is our soil types. Um, our soil types, depending on the area, uh, we have that sandy loam, uh, which is great for hops, uh, with a mid to high pH, uh, allowing that 5.8 to 6.8 pH level, which is very good. 
mm-hmm. um, but it's not great for corn and soy. So that left us with an abundance amount of um, land available to grow these um, hops in Michigan. So the water, the land, and then the 45th parallel, which a lot of people talk about, which allows that six to eight weeks of uh, below freezing temperatures to allow these hops to start themselves over. Um, That kind of puts us into the realm of capability and puts us in the line that pretty much you're hitting Washington, Oregon, Michigan, all the way through Germany, um, kind of the main line, the 45th parallel, um, which really allows us to do that. And uh, and it's not something that we haven't done before Um, back in the 1800s. Uh, hops was a very normal industry here in Michigan, uh, but they got hit with disease, drought, and other things that they couldn't control back in the 1800s, uh, which really wiped out the industry uh, here in Michigan. Well, Chris, um, how have the breweries reacted? I know you work uh, integration kind of from top to bottom. How have some of the breweries reacted to the introduction of uh, new Great, Great Lake hops, really? You know, honestly, it did. It started with the brewers when we when we got the program about ten years ago. We started doing the breeding program, and we knew that at some point we were going to have to do a sensory analysis. Uh, that sensory analysis starts in the field, but it, it continues on to to an aroma sensory program that allows us to start to get an idea of what we're working with. So after we've figured out which hops would grow best in the Midwest in this area region, which we knew we had to have because that was the whole point of the program was to give a competitive advantage to Midwest and Great Lakes area hop growers. Uh, The brewers that we invited in were super receptive right away because for many of them, they've never even been inside of a hop field. Uh, But then to take it a step further and sit down and do these individual panels of unidentified hops that had no names at that time and give us an idea of what they were seeing. And those are all blind introductions. A lot of those breweries began to be completely engulfed into the program. So literally the brewers themselves have been the ones that have helped us identify which hops would then stand out to continue to move forward into our breeding program. Uh, On top of that, it's been a thing, no matter where you go in the Midwest, whether it's here in Michigan, down in Illinois, around Chicago, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, a lot of these states just really support local, 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 local. And, And they've been craving for years the ability to buy the same hops or similar hops like the commodity hops that are available right in their own backyard problem was is the quantity and the consistency just wasn't there so thanks to great farms like hang em high hops who we work with directly and the many farms in our grower group they've been able to build up that consistency that quality and then also fostering those relationships with the brewers the reception at this point is very wide open really what we're trying to do the most is to create that relationship directly to the farm and go farm direct so that farmers like scott and any of those that are working nearby any of those breweries that they'd like to be brewing beers with have that relationship already. They're not just going online, typing in an order, and having it delivered straight to their door. Now, that's available, but we really think that the answer for Michigan and Great Lake Area proprietary hops, it's going to be those relationships. And relationships is really what this community of brewing is all about. And, I mean, you kind of work that end-to-end integration, right, from, from, from the farmer all the way up to the brewer, right? Correct. At first, my, my role would have been just to be in the propagation where we're working the, the propagation and the breeding program and working with the plant material. Again, right away, we saw that there was a gap missing. And so from a, a background that, that I came to Great Lakes Hops working in the beer, wine, beverage, including coffee industry, we saw that maybe maybe there's a chance for us to get inside of those breweries and start working those relationships and then getting that idea out into the community. Once we once we got that craft beer community bought into what we were doing, now we're just creating handshakes between farmers and breweries. I mean, I might possibly have one of the coolest jobs there is because I get to go into breweries, smell hops, and then make really cool beers out of those hops and try to get an idea of what we're working with. And then all I have to do is create those relationships. In truth, my job is selling plants, but I spend more of my time working in breweries than I do working in farms. Well, Scott, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, early stages of hop farming? How do you go from a blank field all the way to uh, to a finished product, you know, which includes drying and everything else? Absolutely. So um, the stages of hop farming and specifically trying to get your products out there to be sustainable or a consistent product for the market is is really what we're focused on. And, and this is our eighth 
fifth year uh, in hop farming. Um, grew up as you know pig and dairy, um, corn and soy. And so when we got into the hop industry, the, the things that we didn't understand uh, back in 2013, 2014, is how important it was to have your infrastructure and then your cost per pound down. So when we started this off with an acre, then two acres, then three acres, then five acres, we were really just testing the ground from 2014 to 2017, understanding more and more about the business and its capabilities. Mm -hmm. When we decided to expand to 28 acres and transfer over to a new facility, we had a pretty good understanding uh, of what we were focused on doing. And the one thing um, that most farms or some farms don't take into account is the soil prep. Um, so first and foremost, um, soil testing, soil prep, understanding exactly what these plants will need. Uh, so our new acreage that we have here, it actually took us a year and a half to two years to get the soil prepped and understanding what its capabilities would be so we weren't dumping money into trying to make something that didn't exist. Uh, mm. And this was all done prior to purchase of the land. Um, from there, you go through design. Uh, you build your hop yard, which is a conglomerate of, of telephone poles and wires. And there's many designs in the market. Uh, we picked our own design, uh, trying to get the cost down to where we would be able to construct these for a cheaper price. And once you're built up and you have these, uh, I don't even know what it is anymore. I think it's uh, well over um, 1,500 telephone poles and all, and all the wire and cabling. and The, the trellises, anchoring. right? Oh, just the, the trellis itself. Um, that's the part that most people think they can throw up. Uh, have it in place, and, and then that's the simple part. Uh, without a sustainable trellis or something that you have to work on every uh, week or every year, uh, um, it's just not profitable. So building what you need and having that construction done correctly. Uh, we've seen lots of hop farms held up by tractors through storms, uh, hooked to wires and cables, and it's a, it's a funny picture, but it just makes my heart sink when I see it across the United States to understand they got thousands, tens of thousands of dollars falling on the ground. Um, from there is planting, and that's kind of where Chris comes in. What varieties grow in your soil? And uh, we can't grow everything here at Hang'em High Hops, um, but the ones that we do grow have all been tested for a year or two in the soil to see if the capabilities are there. You can grow any plant for a year, but you can't grow every plant for, for 20 years. So you try to find ones that fit with your soil type, Understand, we have about three or four different soil types here. So we pick and choose and do little test batches and test samples. And that's where we want to see what our quantity and our quality is going to be. Hmm. Um, some hops love it dry. Some love sandy loam. Some love heavier black dirt. Some like clay and uh, some like gravel. So we really pick that, choose that. Uh, but that all takes time. And that was part of the two-year soil test and plant test. Uh, from there is growing. And growing is uh, one of the things that people thought uh, you could just throw these in the ground and go. Um, fertigation is a huge thing, making sure that all your irrigation is in there, how to feed the plants, how to spray the plants. And uh, during the growing process, we treat them very much like apples. And that's what we try to tell people when they're getting into the business or people that are struggling. Um, we spray every five to seven days. Um, we have lost acres throughout the years um, from not having qualified spray programs. Uh, this was back in the early years. So we learned very quickly that, that stretching that 10-day window for spraying is not something that we even challenge anymore. We spray every seven days just like they do apples. Um, so I, I think I'm on to uh, the harvest side, which some people... Uh, think that they're going to drop these off at the local harvest center and process them and get them back. And all these items add cost. Mm -hmm. So when they're, when, when we were looking at our hop farm of 28 acres, we actually set the farm structure up for 40 plus acres mm -hmm. so that we were capable in both harvest, drying, um, storage, and everything for both what we had in place and if we wanted to grow. Um, so that structure that they look at, which is a, either a wolf harvester or there's some other harvesters out there locally, I always try to find something double the size of what I need. Um, that allows us to have breakdowns. It allows us to have lunch. <laughs> it allows us to be able to get in and out of the field. 
And so our regular harvest days last between uh, eight and nine hours. Uh, that used to last us uh, 12 to 14 hours a day um, because we upsized all of our materials. And that quality um, of getting that product off in a time manner uh, or a time frame that works for you is really part of that science of what these hops do at the end of their life cycle. So when they reach kind of maturity and they're ready for picking, it's when the alpha, the betas, and the oils are kind of at the peak of, of their picking. Same way you look at apples or fruit or anything, it's at the peak of pick. Um, so we get about a 10-day window, mm -hmm. depending on the hop. And some of them have a four-day window, some of them have a 14-day window. And then we schedule and harvest at the peak of that window. So that allows us to do blocks of anywhere from five to eight acres and be able to get those off doing an acre and a half to two acres a day harvest. It allows us to get that product off at peak alpha, beta, and oil sets. And that's really uh, what we're attempting to do here is get a very consistent, very high-end product off the field and to the brewers uh, consistently every year. Um, and then, of course, finally, they have to be dried and processed, right? Well, they'd be dried and processed. And, and truthfully, the drying and the processing is probably one of the easier things to do throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, that's just money. Mm -hmm. the people have the drying and the processing centers and everything else. You can try to skimp your way through a year, um, in which a lot of people have building in their own stuff and doing that. But at the end of the day, if you buy the machinery that, that does the job, that's going to get your product out the door. Um, because if you don't and you're down for two days or you can't run wet hops or you can't run in the rain uh, or your drying capabilities only allows you to do a, a lower end amount of hops, uh, I think our dryers push around 1,000 to 1,400 pounds per dryer, mm -hmm. um, which allows us to do you know a full acre and a half or two acres a day. Um, so yeah, once they're processed and dried, they go into 120 to 150 pound bales, depending on the variety. They go right from the baler right into a, uh, it's a cooler at that point, it's 28 degrees. Uh, and we kind of stall that, that, that bale in its current state. Mm -hmm. Um, from there that it goes right to the pelletizer, um, after the, after it's done. And, uh, we actually pelletize all of our products here, uh, with a large hop grower up in Williamsburg, Michigan, uh, MI local, and they do all of our processing there. Uh, they invested, um, they invested in their design to have a large processing center for pelletizing, which allows us to do about a thousand pounds an hour. Hmm. And at that thousand pounds an hour, it allows us to breathe and uh, really go back to what we love to do, which is uh, growing the hops, selling the hops, um, and, uh, getting them out the door instead of sitting there in front of a pelletizer for, uh, four to six weeks nice well chris um i know the hops uh, like grapes kind of take on the terroir or the characteristics of their environment um what are some of the environmental factors that are reflected in the, the new hops that you're introducing you know terroir is a is a interesting term that's that's used sometimes very very well and and other times maybe not not used well at all you're absolutely right. I mean, hops can reflect uh, not only their environment, but it's, it's a lot to do with soil type and farming practices, just like you would have, like you said, grapes, <clears throat> excuse me, or even coffee. Uh, any commodity, uh, you know, agricultural product is directly affected by, by the individual area of which they're grown and the individuals that are growing it. Uh, you know, just like when you're brewing beer, if you wanted to recreate a beer to, to reflect something maybe from the Eastern European uh, you know, styles of beers, you mm -hmm. would, you would, you would play with different water types, adjuncts and add to that, to that beer build so that you could recreate that. Well, it's, it's really no different in hop farming, um, soil amendments, adjuncts, irrigation, fertigation, harvest time, drying, all of those play factors into what you get in that final product. The, the influence that we have here in the environmental factors, like, uh, Scott had spoke about is we've got very great, uh, influence from from quality soils, uh, really good weather, uh, you know, patterns that come through. Mother Nature does her job by helping us out, especially this week. We've got a great run of rain uh, coming through, but the plant itself, it, it really does just soak up a lot of nutrient out of the soil. So it's the job of the farm to year to year to year readjust their soil, and it's and it's not just adjusting the nutrient; it's the pH. 
uh, hop farmers have to watch everything from the, the macronutrients like nitrogen, but it's the micronutrients that allow that uptake to occur. So mm. there, there is terroir, but I will tell you uh, flat out, it's the farm and it's, it's their best practices that they put into it. And I think any great farm can produce some high quality hops that are going to give you end results uh, that, that reflect anything that you're trying to go after. We have seen hops like Chinook, for example, have different characteristics from state to state and region to region. Uh, and a lot of times that's even affected primarily by, by even the poll time when they are pulling that at harvest time off of the field. And so that's just super important that farms all recognize that it is also their job to, to do all of the right things for the plant. It's even the times of which we feed it, not, not unlike our bodies. Uh, you know, there's a right time and a wrong time to take in carbs and sugars. It's the same thing for plants. It's the right time and the wrong time of the season to, to feed them, to give them nutrient, um, and then maybe even to back off. And sometimes you even need to starve the plant a little bit and make it work harder uh, to get some of those great results. So terroir, it's a word that we use very loosely here at Great Lakes Hops because we really believe in our farmers and we think that our farmers are the ones that are creating the highest quality hop, not exactly the region of which they're growing in. Are you selecting uh, different proprietary hops in a way to, 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 you know, that reflect the region, I guess? All of the hops that, that came through our program, and I know we'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, their growability was absolutely based upon somewhere within the 45th parallel and the kind of different uh, weather patterns we have here in the Midwest. But we do have a couple of hops that are inside of the program that we're just getting ready to send out to different areas and regions. Currently, the 14 farms that work with us are all in the Great Lakes region, uh, spanning from Nebraska, which isn't really Great Great Lakes, all the way to New York. Um, and so and so, we're still very much so in, in only being a 10-year-old program uh, getting more data and information from each of those farms. And we're very excited because every year the farms are going to be sending us back product that we're able to compare side by side by side. And then we're going to work here in Michigan with some of our local brewers and brew the same hop from different regions and put them in the same beer so that we can really try to see what the differences become, not just chemically in the sci- you know the scientific look at the hop, but just what are we getting in that final product. Um, well, Scott, tell us a little bit about the flavor profiles you're getting from some of the new hops that you're growing. Sure, sure. And uh, I had sent you over a pack of all seven. So there's actually seven hops. And uh, the two that started off the program for Great Lakes Hops, which I think he'll talk a little bit about, um, was Mac and Michigan Copper. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mac and Michigan Copper were released, I think, in 2014 and kind of hit the market um, and this was something they were just playing with. It was a select hop for them. It wasn't part of their breeding program at that time. They were just trying to introduce something a little different as they were breeding all the commodity hops. Um, since then, when those things took off, and, and I'm not sh- quite sure on the acreages across the United States of those two hops right now, um, but they, they hit well, and people found that they had sustainability for selling those hops in the market, which I think triggered Great Lakes hops into in producing these next level um, proprietaries and uh, the work that was put in uh, by both Great Lakes hops and Lynn Kimmy um, to produce Hydra, uh, Gemini, Emerald Spire, Paradigm, and Bergamot, uh, which was the next release. And we were lucky enough uh, in that program to have three of these in the ground um, during the MTA trials. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to talk just about a couple of them here. Sure. Um, just quick, uh, Bergamot, uh, is, is our big orange. So it's our summer beer. It's our IPA, big orange, big, juicy, uh, fruity, and it's consistent. So anybody who's brewing with this Bergamot, um, a lot of standalone beers just with Bergamot in it. And that's what they get. And so when I'm trying to sell hops or interacting with brewers, I always ask, you know, what do you want? Do you want a big, juicy, big orange? Um, And if they say yes, I can go right to that product line. Um, When I look at Paradigm, um, I always tell people that Paradigm's the hoppy man's hop. Um, And that's true. I mean, it comes through as big hop, big heavy. And it does give you all your flavor profiles. The ones that are really fun to play with on on Paradigm are the peach and the pear. Uh, that's the ones that the brewers are very interested in. Um, I always call it the all-day IPA hop, which I probably shouldn't say that, but it, 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 when every time I drink a, a Paradigm beer, 
if it's by itself, I taste all day IPA, which isn't a bad thing. I love that beer. Um, Hydra is one of our most prominent, and this one's very, very unique. It, uh, it was originally nicknamed Befuddlement because the brewers couldn't figure out what it was doing. And it has two things that it's working with. Um, it changes as you drink it, and it gives you different flavor profiles on the front of your tongue versus the back of your tongue. Um, and and the, the, unfor- or the fortunate part is, is when, I'm, when we're working with this hop and when we're brewing with this hop, um, it started to enhance the other items inside of the, the recipe. So whether you're using like citra or a different hop in there, it'll take the funnest parts of whatever you're using and it enhances them. And, and we believe, or I believe that that's part of the high maracine levels at 55% maracine that's that really enhances those flavors. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's in the, the top, the top five or the top seven for maracine levels, um, for all hops around Hmm. the world, uh, which is just incredible. Um, And it's kept that consistency after year two, which is even more impressive uh, to get that quality on year two versus year three and four. Um, So we've been very excited with that one, and that uh, that one is our number one or number two seller. Now, the one that I left out there, which has just started to take off in its own little world, and this has been really, really fun, is Emerald Spire. And Emerald Spire uh, gives you a white wine, white grape. And typically, I thought in the beer world, you know, what are people going to use this for? And it's found a home inside of loggers and pilsners, um, inside of some ciders. And people can brew this. And I can't remember the beer that we had down in Grand Rapids, Chris. They can brew it to actually taste like a white wine or uh, actually brew it as a white wine. Um, and it comes out that way and it tastes incredible. Now, my favorite is the lager. Um, it just gives that little bit extra on the lager side. And I think we have now nine lagers being produced and canned around the United States, all Emerald Spire lagers. Um, and that's been awesome. You know, it found its niche. I don't think it's the, you know, it's hit some IPA world, but that has found its niche for sure, uh, in that world. Um, and then we have Gemini there, uh, which is a, is a love-hate. Um, the brewers that brew with this hop um, brew it well, and they're getting that honeydew and fruit punch, um, but strawberry is its, is its number one goal, and, and there's very few hops with that whole strawberry kick, um, but it's very delicate, and it's at the tail end uh, in the whirlpool or in the dry hop to get that strawberry. And it, all of these hops depend on what you're blending with, but those are the strongest attributes that we see out of the hops and, and that we get out of the beers. Um, so that's kind of fun. And, and that's part of my fun part of the job. Anybody who brews with these hops, we offer a buyback program, uh, which allows us to get a six or 12 or 24 pack back of every one of the beers that gets produced, which is now well over a uh, hundred different beers for this year. And we get to flavor taste them and send them to other breweries uh, to have them taste them. So it's been a really fun ride to see what people are producing with these hops being able to do sensories on the beer that's getting processed and then being able to ship these out to other customers to taste you know here's where we're getting the hints of strawberry here's where we're getting the the oddballs of befuddlement or hydra drink through these beers and and that's been a trip um the the brewers call us all the time trying to figure out what did you do with this who did it and then we're connecting brewer to brewer to have those conversations um and it's just been it's been fun. Nice. Um, well, Chris, I know you're heavily involved in the introduction of the proprietary hops through the Great Lake Hops Program. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the proprietary hops program and how that came about? Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it, as Scott mentioned, Lynn Kemi is the, the founder of Great Lakes Hops. And when he first got into the hop uh, propagation field, he was propagating commodity hops, but saw right away that the commodity hops would never give any kind of competitive advantage to the Midwest hop growers that he was working with, uh, be, being somebody who has a, a strong education and background in in plant pathology and understanding what, what exactly it takes to get to something like a breeding program, uh, he saw that he could take an opportunity to go out there and create something new and then make it readily available to, to these farms. So we started with actually uh, 500,000 seedlings that came about from 127 females I'm sorry, 127 females, two males. 
uh, we, when we did those 127 females, each one of them were tested to make sure that they were absolutely uh, the genetics that they were originally cast to be. Uh, and then with those those two males, we came up with the 500,000 seedlings that then we did a small trial to see what success rate came off of those. Uh, that pollination program then produced about 4,000 uh, plants that we were able to put into high density trials. And in that high density trial, we actually looked for vigor, resistance, and, and any other keys that would show us uh, what they were able to do. So what we had was sisters, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and sisters of plant material that maybe just had slight variations and differences. Uh, each of those sisters were then analyzed to find out what the superior uh, uh, strand would be inside of each cultivar. And then we planted a proprietary hop yard of 400 plants. That proprietary hop yard then gave us a, a good look at what the growability would be inside of a actual a hop yard and then we also were able to start doing the sensory program within the yard uh, from there it goes right into what we had talked about earlier where we, we had the breweries begin to work with us we had the farms begin to work with us of which as that began to take off uh, we knew that we had one more step after the brewers helped us identify which unique aromas uh, they were interested in brewing we began to do what we call mta trials uh, hang em high hops and scott mass they were one of the the few farms that jumped in right away and put these plants in their hop yards and gave us a look outside of our own bubble and we created those uh those uh opportunities to let them have a first look at those hops and then also get them to a level that they're brewable so bringing them to a pellet form and then we bring them into the the breweries and we spend a year maybe even two doing brew trials with the with the breweries to make sure that this shows uh, everything that we hope that the hop begins to show uh, as it matures. So that's kind of where we're at today. Uh, we originally released our first hop, like Scott said, 2015 is when we had our first grow year of Michigan Copper and Mackinac. Uh, and then we did the MTA trials in 2018. Uh, 2019, we began planting of the proprietary hops. Uh, the first four we released were the Paradigm, Emerald, Spire, Gemini, and bergamot uh this year 2021 we're releasing hydra and at the end of the season soon to come we'll have aztec so we'll be at eight proprietary hops available to our hop growers um scott you've been involved in growing these hops so what's been your experience getting them out in the field well our experience out in the field um really starts with our grow group um, and we have actually, and I don't know how many farms it is now, but, uh, we allow or, or access all the farmers that are growing these special proprietaries. And we have a group of us, uh, inside of Michigan. And I kind of forgot to mention this, but we, we blend all of our hops together and allow them to get a consistent product. So we work together, um, uh, in, in the process of these hops. Uh, and it gives us about 110 acres uh, out of the five to 700 acres left in Michigan as part of this grow group growing proprietaries. Um, but growing these hops and the capabilities, like I said, we had to really test these hops out to see what would grow. And I think Chris might change this on me, but I think we grew, I grew at least seven or eight different types of hops mm -hmm. inside of this soil. And we really had three that were prominent for this growing area. So I had four or five I had to rip out that just didn't work with the soil. Um, and that was all through testing in that first two years. The, the, the hops that we have here, and I'm interested to see how the other growers do, but they have outperformed all the commodity hops that we have ever worked with in the last eight years um, in both growth, um, disease resistance, bug resistance, and then quality of, um, I guess, poundage per acre, if you want to put it that way. Uh, one of the most interesting is Paradigm. Um, we were hitting numbers above 15 to 1,700 pounds on a plant that had only been in the ground 16 months. And that is unheard of. Um, we typically look at our plant growth. Um, where first year, we don't really look at anymore. Uh, but we used to look at, if you're, if you're getting, you know, depending on, on the year, if you're getting 20, 25%, which is two, 200 pounds, 300 pounds an acre. Um, if we're looking at second year, we really wanted to hit a goal of 750 pounds for a second year. Still not at its maturity rate, but we want the plant to be healthy. And then we're looking into its third year uh, between that 1,250 and 1,500. 
Well, we're hitting those numbers on a third year across the board at that 1250 to 1500 and now above that into our fourth year um, where Paradigm, it's going to be a 2,000 or plus pound uh, an acre hop, um, oh. which is a, a beast. Um, but the growth quality of these plants is what we were so impressed with. Um, their consistency, uh, their consistency, consistency across the board on commercial growing, mm-hmm. where you have some soils, some types where these things will will do different levels, they'll grow differently. These things are very consistent and sustainable, um, and that's what we appreciated. I mean, we've grown the Cascades and Tahomas and stuff like that, and those were good hops, and they were they're, they're great growers. But we had inconsistencies in the product that we don't see with these proprietaries, which I can only you know, thank Great Lakes Hops for producing something uh, that was qualified for our environment, I think is the biggest thing. Not that they would grow like this way in different locations, um, but they grow this way here in Michigan. Hmm. Um, Chris, tell us a little bit about the new hop varieties and how they might compare to some of the hops that we're more familiar with. You, you know, the, the most important thing to our program is that they don't compare um, and that they have a unique quality. Uh, okay. So, very hard to to say because for for a novice who who's in the hop you know field smelling hop, a lot of people are going to smell citrus, pine, <laughs> a little bit of resinous, some herbal notes. Uh, the the difference that we feel separate ours is, is really about the growability inside of our region. Um, the uniqueness is that we're looking for deeper richer flavor profiles uh the goal of this this proprietary hop program is that we'd have hops that can really really uh take away the the need for things like adjuncts into a beer so like scott said bergamot for example Mm -hmm. uh that that is such a big orange hop that there's so many brewers that once used a orange tangerine nectarine adjunct to create maybe a new england ipa with the bergamot they don't need to uh, Emerald Spire. We're super excited about it. And a lot of brewers are just figuring out how to work with it because it's so unique that it can have a grapes in the field, a wild grape note to it, even sometimes a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so so when we look at these and, and we say, okay, h- how do we compare them to, to other hops? It's really something that we'd like to veer from. In fact, we tell uh, all of our hop growers to, to avoid going into a, a brewery and saying, hey, this is kind of like the new Sabro or this is like the new Mosaic. And, and in fact, just having those those hops fall off my tongue is completely against what we do because because we're really here to try to grow a brand for the growers. This is not about Great Lakes hops. In fact, our growers own the hops uh, and they're the ones that, that are owning that right to go out and, and be licensed to not just grow them, but then distribute them so uh each one of these hops has a unique uh uh you know characteristic uh and and then usability to it for example we're beginning to see as the maturity comes uh some of these hops are really showing new characteristics michigan copper for example is becoming just an amazing super uh aroma and super versatile hop that can be used in the bittering end all the way to a a dry hop by itself and, and more and more people are telling us that it has a Hawaiian fruit punch or like a, a big fruit punch aroma and, and style to it, which we, we didn't see in the in the first couple of years of it. But now we're into, you know, crop years five and six with that hop. So the maturity of these hops are going to really help us to get a better look. And that's really about those seven essential oils that are the, the dominant oils that, that come out in the hop. So which ones do they compare to? We hope none. We hope that our hops uniquely stand on their own. And, and then and then have uh, the ability to play well with those other hops, though. So we're, we're brewers, too, and we love beer. Uh, I drink beer with other hops in it. And, and I believe truly that, that hops like our paradigm can stand alone and stand up against any hop that's out there. But but it also can blend in and work well with with any hop around around the world. Uh, Scott, what's your what's your, been your experience getting these hops, particularly into the hands of commercial brewers? Um, that's the fun part. Um, so we've been having, uh, I'm going to say a hundred percent success rate with interaction with breweries and getting these hops to breweries, having them brew with them and coming back with a product that they're both happy with and saleable. Um, you know, that was the one part as a hop grower and not a brewer I couldn't control. 
And once we were getting these to market, and like he said, the MTA trials, Great Lakes brought these to market as an unnamed pellet originally for a year or two as we were growing them. So this being our first really commercial grow year where we were kind of presenting these to the world uh, allowed us to advertise to the entire United States. And currently, i um, very proud of this, uh, Little Free Soil Michigan has hops in all 50 states. Um, so there's 7,500 licensed breweries, and out of those, we're working with anywhere from 300 to 700, depending on our distribution group. Um, so we're looking at around 7 to 10% of the market at least gets presented these hops and are interacting with them. And this year is a grow year, and we know that brewing uh, large quantities of hops doesn't happen on a grow year or a first-time interaction. They're doing test samples. We got people with 20-barrel systems doing one-barrel test batches, and we got people with you know, three-barrel systems that buy uh, enough to, to, to last the whole year. But the good thing about this, and, and that's the reason we have the buyback program, is we offer so many incentives to get these hops into your kettle because we want to brew as many beers this year as possible. Our goal was 200, and I think we're in the 130 range right now. So we have the rest of the year to gain that other 70 new beers. And the response back rate has been incredible. Um, people are playing with these things differently than not how they were designed, but that question you had on what can they replace. I get that every day. And I tell them the same thing Chris just said. They don't replace anything. You know, you can add them with this. And now that we're getting more and more knowledge of beers and what they're making, I tell them different things that work with it. Um, you know, but they always ask, can this replace this one or this one? And, and specifically, um, you know, the softwares and stuff like that, they always show what can you replace this hop with? Yeah. And I'm always interested to see what that's going to say, because uh, some of these hops are standalone by themselves. Uh, one of my favorite beers right now is uh, I think it's Amarillo and Hydra. Um, mm. One of my favorite beers that, that has been made. I love these things playing with other ones. And, and that's that's been uh, incredible. But from selling hops for three years as commodity and selling these hops for the last two years as proprietary, um, it, there's no question these are easier, better quality hops to sell for us as unique and uh, gives us an advantage in the market, which we just didn't have before. And, and we wouldn't be in business anymore if we didn't have these hops uh, in the ground. Um, Chris, where can people learn more about these hops and perhaps even purchase them? And, and I, I guess the other follow-up question, would you have, do you have them available for homebrewers as well? Well, absolutely. Uh, so the easiest way to, to get into the hops, if you want to grow them, uh, is you can go to Great Lakes hops, uh, but you can't, you can't purchase these, these hops as a, uh, a hobby farmer or a, just a normal retail farmer, somebody that's just doing right. this, uh, you know, in your backyard. Um, so if you, if you want to be engaged and work in our hop network, uh, it takes a, a level of vetting. So we, we started off by uh, offering the opportunity to some farms here locally that were, were really willing to, to do the MTA trials with us. And as we've grown the, the process, what we're looking to do is create hubs of farms where, where we'll have a larger uh, vertically integrated uh, farm that's able to support some smaller farms and like Scott said then be able to do the blending process if available uh, but to to work together rather than separate and as far as uh, available to home brewers well you're talking to the right guy and that the right guy isn't me it's Scott Mast. Uh, Hang 'em High Hops has absolutely uh, done amazing amazing things to, to get these hops into the, the homebrew market. And so you can go to Hang 'em High Hops uh, website and be able to take a look at their full collection um, right away. When when we got working with our first four farms, MI Local, uh, uh, Hang 'em High Hops, Pure Mitten, and Two Trek to produce those first few trials, right away, Scott uh, and myself were talking about the, the number one consumers of these beers that are going to come out inside of the breweries is going to be homebrewers. There's, there's no... Nobody more persnickety and, and more knowledgeable about hops and beer than a home brewer. And so we were super excited to say, hey, why, why don't we try to find a way to maybe get into the homebrew shops and work with home brewers? So on my end, I've been doing sensory aroma analysis and then all kinds of fun uh, field trips uh, and networks and working with the, the homebrew groups throughout Michigan. 
uh, and then also uh, the different brew schools uh, that are that are throughout our area and the Midwest. And Scott, at the same time, has been working with homebrew shops and, and individuals like yourself too that that touch uh, base with our homebrew market. And and we're really excited to be able to offer that opportunity. Uh, if, if home brewers are interested, I heavily advise them to take a look at our website to see the origin story and where we are from, uh, and then go straight over. And there's a link on our website right to Hang 'Em High Hops. Uh, I know it sounds like a Hang 'Em High Hops promo, but but there there is <laughs> there is no farm uh, more influential and probably no farm more connected to what we're doing. And we appreciate Scott and Todd. And Ron, for, for, for really working with us directly, uh, sometimes we joke and we say we're, we're married uh, through the hop business, uh, but we kind of are. And and that's what we would really love to see is the home brewers to get those first looks at these hops. Uh, you know, we have fun niche products, too. We've got a little six-ounce can uh, that has six ounces of each of these proprietary hops inside of our website and also available at Hang'em High's website. Uh, that if a home brewer wants something fun and new to play with where you want more than just, say, one ounce... Uh, it's a fun package. It shows the logo and the branding and everything attached to what we do. Uh, and then it gives you an opportunity for like a homebrew club to do a multi-batch set. Uh, Scott, can we get your uh, closing thoughts on uh, on the whole you know, growing hops in Michigan and the, the experience you've had? Yeah, actually, I wanted to just uh, respond to that uh, um, sure. homebrew. Uh, the homebrewers clubs are uh, one of our number one focus. Uh, so there's 415 homebrew stores throughout the United States. We're currently in 47 of them. Um, and out of those homebrew, almost all the brewers we work with were originally homebrewers. And so we found them as the best marketing tool we could do to get these into breweries. So we spent actually three full months just advertising and working with homebrew stores and we really want to get them introduced and it's tough because you got to have recipes written you got to have an understanding because a lot of these home brewers need that info to purchase um so we do a ton of advertising and the fun thing about it is home brewers love to show off their beers so the social media interaction with home brewers homebrew clubs um sponsorships we have a homebrew sponsorship down in detroit this year uh, we have one in California, we have one in Texas, we have one in Florida where we offer prizes for first, second, and third, offering brew-offs, free hops, free samples. Um, it's just been wonderful. The homebrew market, brewers are busy. Homebrew stores and homebrewers, this is what they do for fun, and this is what they love to do. So we get a lot of feedback and a lot of talking. Just can't say enough about that homebrew world and how crazy those guys are. They'll they'll try anything and do anything uh, to, to make a new beer. Um, it's fun. Uh, Chris, your closing thoughts, perhaps? You know, honestly, I, it comes down to what we do is, is, is try to provide a high quality product for those local breweries, uh, big or small. And so just the, the call out to all of those who love craft beer is, is know the products that are in your beer. And ask the questions and get to know what's going on inside of your brewery and where they're purchasing their product at. It, it shouldn't just be beer. It, uh, you know, for us, we, we're all about local uh, and each local market. So just like you would want to know where, where your products are coming from for the food that you eat, do the same with your beer and, and support local. Uh, it, it may be one of those things that's just a little question. And if, and if the brewers or the, uh, the, the bar keeps that are, that are helping to pull those tap handles, don't know those answers, uh, asking those questions is going to encourage them to, to dig deeper. And, and we're going to do our due diligence to help in the education process of those those different uh, areas of people that come in contact with our, our end product customer base, uh, which is you, the beer consumer. Uh, but, but ask those questions. Where, where do the hops come from? What hops are inside of this beer? Uh, where did the grain come from? Where, where's the yeast from? And these things are important because if we, if we support local, and that's the way our craft industry survived, uh, this lo- this last pandemic, I mean, obviously was completely influenced by the ability for people to shop local and support their local businesses. And, and now the breweries are supporting the local farms. Uh, and that'll continue if you as the consumers uh, continue to ask what hops are in this beer. Well, Scott, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Um, and I wonder, Brad, can I put my closing thoughts in there? I Absolutely. I'm question. sorry. Hey, not a problem. Um, 
closing thoughts are just uh, hang them high hops um, is really out there to provide the brewers with a new opportunity. Uh, one of the funny things in this world uh, currently is, is people wanting to work hands off. Um, I have put my phone number on over 10,000 sent out letters, emails, and everywhere. everywhere. That, that's my phone number. That's my cell number. You get me. Uh, we can talk hops. I'm in the hop barn every single day. And just really looking forward and appreciate the groups out there working with these new hops, brewing these new hops, getting samples back to us. Um, across the board, it's been a pleasure um, and looking forward to the next two to three years of, of interacting with these new brewers and these new hops. And hopefully we can keep up with production. Uh, we're putting new plants in all the time. So uh, just a just a big thank you to the brewers out there and looking forward to working with you. If you see my email come through, it's not some business out there trying to do advertising. It's it's me sitting in the hop barn sending you an email direct. Well, Scott, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate you having us. And Chris, same to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, Brad, Great Lakes Hops and myself. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to uh, just get the word out there. It's been nice talking with you. And my guests today were uh, Scott Mast and Chris Vogel. Scott is a Michigan-based hop, far- hop farmer and owner of Hang 'em High Hops. And Chris is an employee with Great Lake Hops specializing in proprietary hop varieties. Thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to Scott Mast and Chris Vogel for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, oil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new Brew Commander. To order yours today, go to BlickmanEngineering.com. Finally, I'm happy to say that the new web-based version of Beersmith is available now at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the web lets you brew, edit, and edit Create recipes from any browser, including your desktop, tablet, or mobile device. You can try Beersmith Web for 30 days by setting up a free account at BeersmithRecipes.com. Or purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, and you get both Beersmith Web and the desktop version for one low price. Check out BeersmithRecipes.com to give it a try today. I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 